This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. I, I want you to think this morning, what's the kindest thing that anyone has, has ever done for you? Okay, what's the kindest thing that anyone's ever done to you? Can we take a couple of examples? Some brave? Okay, might be asking too much here. Uh, uh, one of the kindest things that anyone ever did for me was um, uh, when I was, a, I was a kid, I remember I would go off, kind of like my daughter uh, just did over here. I would go off and I would wander away and I would, I would go and, and, you know, we'd be in the mall. I'd go into like different department stores and, and just kind of like, you know, no sense of safety, no sense of self-preservation. <laughs> And I would get lost sometimes. I got lost. Uh, I got lost at the mall. I got lost one time at Center Island. That was fun. Um, and uh, um, and I remember looking around and uh, and being being very afraid because I suddenly realized. I remember this feeling, looking around and realizing your parents are nowhere around and you're calling out and they can't hear you wherever you are. They're not there. And uh, I remember uh, a really kind person, uh, this was the one in Center Island, who stopped, uh, had some kids, stopped, had, had everything that they were doing. They were going off to another ride. Um, they uh, spent some time with me. They took me to, I think there was some kind of booth where there's an administration center. They had me sorted out. They called, you know, all around. They, they, they searched around. They, it took some time, and they finally found my mom, who was not happy. <laughs> Um, and um, I, remember, I remember that because of how much time it took. I remember they were on their way to do other things, some of the same things that I was uh, enjoying doing. I remember that it was really my own fault, like I got them into this. I knew that they didn't really have to do anything, but they, they had freely given uh, their time to me. And so uh, whether it's that answer, whether it's another answer that you guys might, might privately kind of have on your own to that question, um, if you stop and think about it for a second, your answer to that question, what's the kindest thing that anyone ever did for you, it, it probably depends on, on a lot of factors. Uh, I, I would guess that part of it depends on how much you needed to experience that act of kindness in that moment. I definitely did. It depends on what you were going through at the time. It depends on whether you felt like you could have done that for yourself. It probably depends on whether you felt like you earned that thing or whether someone showed you kindness without making you feel like you needed to earn it. And it depends on, on the other person too. Did that person show kindness willingly? Did they have to be talked into it? Did they do it grudgingly? Did they expect to get something out of it? Or was that kind, kindness freely given even though they did not have to, even though you could not pay them back for how they'd been kind to you? Did it come from a place of care? This morning, as a bit of a one-off, we're looking at the story of a young woman named Ruth and the kindness that was shown to her. And more than that, it's a story about us and how God has shown us incredible kindness too. And if we want to take it a little bit further, this is the kindness that God wants to show through us to the whole world, starting with Ancaster. To our family and our friends and our neighbors and to the regular server at the restaurant that you like to go to who knows your whole family's first names and to your kid's teacher and maybe your Zumba instructor. Uh, everyone that God has placed into your life on a regular basis. Uh, because the message of God's kindness is too good to keep to ourselves. This message of God's kindness is so good that we too are called to this kind act of sharing it with others so that other people can experience God's kindness as well. When we met Ruth in chapter 1, for those of you who've read through the book of Ruth before, uh, she was in need. Uh, at the beginning of chapter 2, she still is in need. Here's her situation. Uh, her husband has died. She's separated from her people. She's living in a foreign land. She's been through famine and danger. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1 says that she lived during the time of the judges when some of the most disturbing situations in all of Scripture were happening regularly in Israel. There's a, a group of us, actually, that's going through the whole Bible in a year together, chronologically. We just came out from judges, and that was a, that was a pretty hairy, uh, pretty, pretty scary time in uh, Israel's history. It was a dark time, and it was dangerous, and Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, were hungry, and so she is in need of kindness. And another word for kindness is, is favor. And so Ruth says to Naomi in chapter 2, verse 2, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find 
favor. Favor. So the first thing to notice here is that Ruth realizes her need and she goes looking for favor in the, in the land of God's people in Israel, whom she had chosen to belong to back in chapter 1. Here's her journey of seeking favor in uh, verses 1 to 7 again. It shows how uh, she had been, uh, she had a, a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth said to Naomi, Let me glean among the field um, in, after him, in whose sight I shall find favor. She doesn't know exactly where she's going or what she's doing, but she's hoping that she will encounter favor there, that, that there will be kindness. And uh, Ruth's mother in law says, Go. Verse 3, she sets out and she gleans in the field uh, of Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, the Lord is with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. And Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this. And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman. She's not of God's people. She's not of the land of Israel. She's one of, part of one of the, uh, the, the enemy uh, countries of Israel. And what's she doing here? And he could have responded to that in any way. Look, she is the young Moabite woman. But then he goes on and says in verse 6, who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now except for a short rest. She hasn't remained in the area where she's from. She has come to God's people. She has said that she belongs with God's people. You see her working so hard, and she is just looking to be shown a little bit of kindness. And Roaz looks out, and he sees Ruth doing this, and his heart is moved. So what does Ruth teach us about seeking favor in this passage? Well, unlike Naomi's late husband Elimelech, Ruth doesn't seek favor in the land of Moab. She seeks the favor of God among the people of God. She says to Naomi back in chapter 1, Your people will be my people. Your God shall be my God. See, there's, there's this uh, theme throughout the book of Ruth of finding rest. And there's so many things that Ruth could try to find rest in. She could try to find rest in another land, but she doesn't. She could try to find rest in some shady kind of work just based on this being the time of judges and some of the stories we find there to try and provide financial security. But she doesn't. She could try to find rest in the various gods of the Moabites, but she doesn't. Because true rest can only be found in the God of Israel and in community with God's people. And just a a side note here, This would be the best reason for why we would want to try to revitalize a church to serve those in Ancaster and the surrounding surrounding communities because we live during a time when there there are so many other things, so many alternative answers that people are turning to in order to find true rest for their souls. I, I see this when I go to the library, when I go to Value Village to see what's on the bookshelf, and I go to the religion section, and it's all just things that point people back to themselves. That's where they're looking for answers. And they can try to find it in distraction. They can try to find it in, in entertainment or substance use. They can try to find it in subjective spirituality like the religion of Moab back in Ruth's day, which promises that the answer is found deep inside of you, only for that to be a dead end too. Some can try to find rest for their souls in doing good acts for others, only to realize that all too often our good intentions can be mistaken or misguided. Our actions might even be enabling or harmful. And then we're left again with ourselves, with our heads in our hands. And there's this futility, there's this restlessness, there's this darkness that often arises from that. And so, for example, according to most surveys, we are living in a place and a time where depression and anxiety and mental illness are at an all-time high at a time when people are the most free to, just like in Ruth's day, do whatever is right in their own eyes. And what is the answer to that? Well, it's to bring the message of God's kindness out to places like Ancaster and to say that true rest can be found in the God of Israel, in the God of the Bible, in the God, of, in the God who reveals himself in the person of Jesus. That's where true rest and true favor can be found. What else can Ruth teach us about seeking favor? Well, she starts being faithful with what she knows, and she lets God guide her from there. Uh, So she's aware that the answer is not other gods, it's God. And it's not found in other peoples, it's found among God's people. 
And it's not found in doing anything criminal. It's in the legitimate forms of income available to her. And so she heads out and she does the one thing that she can do. She gleans among the grain and she waits for God's answer on the other side of that. She just says to Naomi, let me go to the field in whose sight I shall find favor. And that just happens to be the field of Boaz. Okay, so, so she seeks for God's favor. And then we see that she, she receives favor. We see this in uh, uh, Ruth chapter 2, verses 8 to 13. Just to go over quick, because we read it before the sermon. It says, uh, starting in verse 8, Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and your mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. Okay. So she seeks for God's favor, and then she receives favor. Where does God guide Ruth to as she seeks favor? Verse 3 says, She happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. And verse 4 says, Boaz came from, from Bethlehem. Here in verses 8 to 13, we see the favor that she received from Boaz. Now, now who is Boaz? Boaz is the ancestor of King David. And his line is the one from whom Jesus will be descended. We find that out in chapter 4. Boaz is the man from whom the promised deliverer of Genesis and Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy will eventually come. And that's actually the point of the whole book. The book of Ruth takes place during this dark period in Israel's history, this, this time of the judges, and it shows how even during that time, God was slowly enacting his rescue plan for his people through the story of Ruth and Boaz. And that's why the book of Ruth ends with a genealogy which wraps up, wraps up the story in this way. It says, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, and Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. But why did God want Boaz's story to end up in our Bibles? Why not the tales of Obed? Uh, why not the book of Salmon, uh, Boaz's father? Maybe there was something kind of fishy about him. Um, I... Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> I, I believe that the story of Boaz and Ruth is in our Bibles because in God's wisdom, he knew that this particular story would point us to Jesus. Take a look at how this book illustrates the gospel for us, okay? Boaz, the one from whom Jesus descended, comes from Bethlehem. He is God's chosen kinsman redeemer who is able to redeem Ruth because he is a close relative, just as Jesus was able to redeem us because he was made flesh and became like us and dwelt among us and was near to us. In Boaz, through his union with Ruth, just like with Jesus, both Jew and Gentile are grafted in together and become one people, even part of the royal family of God. The people that Ruth comes from, the Moabites, they are part of a people who are under a curse and under the judgment of God. But Ruth shows us that to all who seek God's favor, even those who were once far from God or under judgment, there is room in God's family for them. And so many times in this passage, Ruth is not called a foreigner. She is not called a cursed woman. She is not called a sinner. What is she called by Naomi and Boaz? She's called daughter. I'll point that out as we continue on through this passage. And that's a picture of the gospel for sure. That though we were far from God, though we sought answers in all the wrong things, though we were by nature under a curse, though we were experiencing spiritual famine in the midst of dark times, 
Jesus, God in human flesh, descended in his humanity from the line of Boaz. He found us out in his harvest field, and he brought us in. He showed us favor. He wrapped his arm of protection around us. He gave us the best of what he had. He pronounced blessing over us. He called us his children. He redeemed us. He sought us. Jesus, the true and greater Boaz, has done for each of us us Ruths, what we could not have done for ourselves. He is the one in whom we find favor, and we may find our rest in him. Amen? See, Ruth was working hard, and she was faithful, but she wasn't the answer to her own problems. She needed a redeemer. She needed the one from whom Jesus would one day be descended She needed to receive favor from something or someone outside of herself. And she sought it, and she found it. She found it in Boaz, the the precursor, the forerunner of Christ. And so, not only do we see Ruth seeking favor and receiving favor, but now, as one who has received favor like us, she is welcomed to the table of fellowship where she is given bread and wine. Uh, read with me verses 14 to 16. It says that at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. And so she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some of the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean. Don't rebuke her. To all who seek God's favor, like Ruth, God extends favor to them through Jesus. He finds us in his harvest field, and he calls us child, and he brings us to himself. And he pronounces promises and blessings over us. And then look at what Boaz does here. Having been shown favor, Ruth not only has a relationship with Boaz, but now she is a part of Boaz's people. She sits among the reapers. At the end of this chapter, she walks along with Boaz's young maidservants. She eats and she drinks along with others from the bounty of the master of the harvest field. Boaz personally passes her roasted grain, which she eats, and so she receives again from the hand of favor at the table of her Redeemer. More than 3,000 years later, we are still doing this. We did it a couple of weeks ago for Good Friday. In the words of a song by a band called Thrice that I used to enjoy, still do, it says, Once again the bread and wine, though it seems the meaning may be deeper still this time, What the meal at Boaz's table foreshadowed, the the bread and wine or, or the juice, illustrates for us by way of reminder. See, Jesus is our true bread and our true drink. We can find no sustenance in any but him, and only in seeking him will we find true favor and true rest. Also, Jesus' body was broken for us, and his blood was poured out for us, accomplishing a greater redemption than anything that Ruth and Ruth and Boaz's story ever could have illustrated. And and third, we who have sought his favor and received it, now we are made one new people. We are brought into table fellowship together. We are called his children, but now we are all his children who are part of his household, the church. And we are given the gift of our Redeemer. We are the gift of belonging to one another. I remember when I was um, a young, younger man, um, and uh, just out of high school, just in my 20s, and I was living in my first place on my own in a, in a town in, in Saskatchewan called Moose Jaw. And the, the big city in Saskatchewan is, is called uh, Saskatoon. And there was a church planter there, a guy who was starting up a, a, a brand new church. And he wanted to, to mentor some young people in how to, how, to, how to do gospel work, how to go out and to tell people about Jesus, how to, how to plant churches and see people transformed and all of that kind of thing. And so I was really interested that, in that. And so me and my, my friend Greg, who actually was here uh, a, a, a while ago, uh, visited with us. Uh, we got into a car together and um, we had no money at the time. We were 
we were, there's broken, there's college broken. We were college broke. And, um, and so we, you know, where you're kind of measuring like how far do we want to take the car? You know, how much fuel could we put in? That kind of thing. So we, <laughs> even though we were college broke, we, we looked at the groceries that we had in our apartment and we decided that we could make it with just the tuna and the potatoes. Um, and <laughs> we would put that money into our tank instead. And so we, we drove up to Saskatoon to take part in this church planter training. And um, uh, uh, it's at a church called Grace Fellowship. Um, and the pastor was Murray McClellan, who I, ended up, I later ended up working at that church just before I came here. And uh, uh, that was a great season. And, um, and so we drove up and we're participating in this training, and it's a wonderful weekend, and we come back down, and then Pastor Murray gives me a, a phone call and says, Sean, would you, would you want to come out for the regular regular training, the, the thing that we do every month? And I said, you know what? Like, I, I don't know if I can. Like, I, 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 even when I get there, like, I don't really have a place to stay. I can't afford, like, the hotels. I, I don't know if I can get that time off. I, you know, like, taking care of meals is going to be a hard thing. I don't think I can do this. And I remember Pastor Murray just stopped me and said, Sean, you have a hundred beds to sleep on when you come to Saskatoon. You don't need to worry about food because you have a hundred refrigerators. Because the church has a hundred beds and the church has a hundred refrigerators. You come down and we'll take care of the rest. We're your people and you belong, you belong with us. And it is true, every time I went up to Saskatoon and, and, and uh, spent a, a weekend out there, never had to look for a place to stay, never look at, had to look for a meal to eat. They, they took care of me because I belonged with them. They were my brothers and sisters in Christ. We've got it covered. And so Ruth, she seeks favor and she receives favor and she's welcome to the table of fellowship. And now, after all this, we see her walking in favor. She's received it. Now she's living it, starting in verse 17. It says, uh, So she gleaned in the field until evening, and she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the, into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she also brought, brought out and gave to her what food she had left over after being satisfied. By the way, there is a note. As Jesus has satisfied us and given us all the spiritual nourishment we need, he gives us more than we need so that we can then share it with others. Okay? Verse 19. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today and where have you worked? Blessed is the man who took notice of you. And so she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forgiven the, for, forsaken the living or the dead. And Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, you know, It was a back and forth conversation. And Ruth the Moabite said, Beside he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. Verse 22, Then Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women lest in another field you be assaulted. Verse 23, So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. And so she's received this favor. She's been shown this kindness. Now she goes out into the field, and she accepts the kindness that Boaz has shown to her, and she's able to even share the overflow of what she has given with other people. She is not only... Uh, sought favor and received it and been welcomed, but now she can walk in that favor. Now she can be a source of favor and blessing to somebody else because she has received from the hand of the master of the harvest and she has more than what she needs. And so we can do this as we are uh, serving and living and, and, and active in Ancaster. We're doing this as we take runs out to the food bank. We're doing this as we meet with people who are coming and using the, the, the area back behind our church to walk their dogs and play with their kids. We're doing this as we see other people coming around and asking, hey, is there, some, is there a way that we could partner with you in the use of the building? We're doing this as Diabetes Canada has looked for um, a place to host their, their, their bin to take collections and donations. We said, we've got some space. For sure, we can do that. Okay, we're doing this as... People come around and we get to talk to them about who we are, about what Jesus has done for us, 
about what He wants to do in their lives. We walk out of the favor that we have been shown. The grace, grace is another word for that. The grace that we have been shown. And we say, that grace doesn't have to just be for me. That grace can be for you too. Why are we revitalizing a church in Ancaster? Why are we doing that? We're doing that because Jesus works through his church. Because this is where the gospel goes out from. This is where people meet Jesus and are welcome to table fellowship and find a home amongst God's people. That's why we're doing this. It's hard and it's difficult and uh, we have things that we try and they don't always go well and some things do go well and there's excitement but there's uncertainty and all of that. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because we have found favor in the sight of God and we want others to find favor in the sight of God too. We want them to come to him and to know him. That's what the church is all about. Amen? So, uh, may you seek the favor of God. May you receive it. May you be welcomed in the midst of his people. And may you walk in favor, knowing that he has blessed you, that he loves you, that he accepts you and welcomes you, and that you are his. Let me pray.